There we go. Okay, so now we're recording for our January tips and share meeting. Um, the, the YouTube site that John mentioned, uh, put the link up on our Google groups. Um, we've done some recording of the monthly programs. Um, we got Rafe's up there, Mike Fleckenstein's, um, Steve Sudeby and Dana Bell. So we have four of those programs up there. We've got the September and October meetings themselves that are recorded. I'll get those up <clears throat> on YouTube as well. And then you can just go in and, you know, look at the videos anytime you want. Um, I'm gonna try and use it as kind of a resource to, especially for the video content. We can't post it to the website. We can't post it to Google Groups. So this is kind of the only place we can put it. Um, so we'll be, as John was saying, we'll be putting more and more things up on uh, hopefully up on the YouTube site um, and also be able to spread the content around, you know, a little bit more. So there we go. Yeah. Yeah. The, the link to the link to the, to the uh, YouTube channel is also on, on the website. You can get to it that way. That's, that's right. Mike put it up on the website. Thanks for that. Good job. Good job. It's a little, it's a little icon at the bottom of the screen that says YouTube and it'll take you right to that channel. Not to, not to general consumption YouTube, right to the Nova channel. Right, right. Okay. Um, if but John, should we just go ahead and get started with the program and then jump into Rafe doing his uh, demonstration? It sounds good to me. Rafe, see that you've joined here. We're ready for you. Yep, okay, we're gonna hang on just for a minute here. <clears throat> I do have the uh, presentation queued up, so we're ready to go with that. Okay, just, um, uh, I unmuted, so can uh, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, sound okay. good. I'm gonna share the screen from uh, my laptop, not the iPhone. So if I could do that, uh, I will get it going. You should be ready to go here. Uh, yep, there we go. Okay, great. So good evening, everybody. And what I was going to talk about is a, a little overview of a product that I've just been using for the last, I don't know, three or four weeks, uh, which is uh, airbrush stencils. And um, what I like about them is it gives you an opportunity to create sort of a weathered appearance that you see on a lot of uh, aircraft and vehicles that are in service from the effects of the weather. And it's very much a subtle technique. It's, it's hard to see from a long distance, but when you get up closer in this shot, you can sort of see what I'm talking about under the cockpit. And it's really a function of giving some very uh, appearance uh, and different tones to your paint finish. And I sort of look at it as um, a, uh, a, a foundation technique. Uh, there are other things that you want to do on top of it. Uh, I find that the most effective weathering is usually built up with lots of different layers, but this is sort of the foundation paint and it's very subtle. Uh, I guess another way I think about it is it's sort of uh, the equivalent of a Pinot Noir modeling technique where you have to really appreciate the subtleties and look at it, it doesn't hit you over the head as opposed to like a, a Merlot technique, like putting wash and panel lines and wiping it off where you like the effect, it's good, but it's, it's, it's pretty stark and, and in your face. And there are, a number of different products that are available to, to do this technique. Uh, Art Tool makes a set, and I've put hot links in this and can send it to Chris so that um, you can check this. The Art Tool ones work well. Uh, they're made out of cardboard, uh, so they're a little less sturdy and not permanent. There are also uh, equivalents available from AK, which are made out of plastic, which I'll be using this evening and I think work really well. And then Bushi uh, has a set that uh, comes with three different templates that um, are made out of photo etch, which obviously makes them very sturdy and, and easy to clean. Uh, they were a little hard to find, but um, I learned from Angel that Mike World Games, his shop has them available. So both the AK image and the Ushi are, are linked uh, to his uh, web store if you want to check those out. And then Brian had mentioned he had turned me on to a set uh, out of Australia that um, are, is made by Voyager model. They are also photo etch and uh, work really well. So you got a number of different options, but again, I'll be using the AK one. And 
I also want to be sure to say that this is not anything that I've invented. It's something I've been reading about for a while. These two specific publications are where I've drawn most of what I'll be showing tonight from, and I think they have some of the best overviews of the technique. You can do it both as a pre-shade um, mapping technique, and then you can also do it over a painted finish to sort of get a, a grimy, dirty appearance, which is what they did for the Victor on the uh, Model Airplane International cover shot on the right. And again, these are uh, also hot linked. If you want to uh, try to track down uh, these publications, they're both still available as back issues. So uh, just to give an overview of what I'll be doing, and then I should dive in and do it live. Uh, the basic uh, process is to lay down a, a black primer coat. In this case, I'm using uh, Outlab black primer and microfiller. And then you basically work spraying through the stencils uh, a lighter tone, and this is a pre-shade effect. Now, I've been working with a technique where you sort of lay this in manually by hand, and it takes forever. This makes it dead easy and fast, which you'll see. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. You want as random an appearance as you can get. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some things that you might want to think about just in terms of setting um, volume and tonal values, but uh, pretty straightforward. And then over that, you slowly build up your finished color. And you don't want this to leap out at you, like I say. Now, I will say that it could probably be a little uh, starker than you think because the final clear coats and dull coats will um, tone it down considerably. And you can sort of see the, the undulations that I'm talking about up on the wingtip. But what I did is I bumped up the contrast in the same shot, just so you could really see what it looks like. But that's a little bit starker than what it looks like in real life. It's something that you sort of have to look over and you start seeing some really pleasing uh, variances. And then this is an overshot of uh, the accurate miniature spot list for which the monogram kit was uh, sort of my test bed to work out all these techniques and it's coming along well. So with that, I'm gonna flip over to the phone and we'll actually do some spraying. Okay, so Chris, if you can give precedence to the, uh, the Raymond's iPhone. Let me find it here real quick. Uh, let's see, where are you? Actually, I don't see that one on screen. Um, uh, let's go ahead and start letters. the video. There you go. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> there we go. All now right, good right. to go. Okay, so um, first thing, just as a, a general tip, um, I'm a big proponent of wiping the model surface down with a plastic prep. This particular product by Poly S isn't made anymore, uh, but if you use a uh, isopropyl alcohol, uh, pretty much works just the same, but you just won't get all the grease off of it so you don't run into any adhesion problems. And uh, again, what I'm gonna be spraying is uh, Alclad black primer and microfiller. Um, and what I do, it's theoretically uh, thin enough to spray out of the bottle, but um, I have found that it works a little bit better out of the Badger airbrush that I'm using to thin it a little bit. So I'm gonna put about half of one of these communion cups full of paint and then just clean that off and set that down. And just gonna be thinning it with uh, regular lacquer thinner. This is a tester's bottle, but the lacquer thin it actually is just from uh, Home Depot in the gallon can that I transfer. And no rhyme or reason to it. I just thin it down with, uh, you know, maybe uh, a fifth uh, by volume of the amount of paint. And we'll get it stirred up. The other advantage of thinning with a little bit of a lacquer thinner is that it allows the, uh, the paint to dry even faster. So I'm gonna be spraying and doing this real time, but uh, it's dry to the touch to work on within a few minutes. Um, so I'll get it loaded in the airbrush here. I thought I was the only one that still had a bottle of the pink poly S um, plastic cleaner. Yeah, um, I've had mine, it, it, it goes a long way, but I'm gonna be sad when it's all gone. 
Okay, so get this cranked up. So this is a uh, Badger 200, which um, I think is a good solution for priming. And actually, um, uh, Alclad uh, has Badger making this model airbrush for them under their own brand. So he had rec the manufacturer had recommended it as a good fit. So I usually like to test my spray pattern just on an index card, get that working. I'll just go over. I'm gonna get an initial dusty coat onto this. One thing I do find, which isn't a bad thing, but when you uh, thin thin it down with the lacquer thinner, it actually makes it a little bit uh, shinier and glossy. And you can do the same thing with the Alclad Gray, which is a, a recommended undercoat for their uh, metallic colors, but this makes it a little bit nicer uh, for those metallic finishes as a primer underneath it. If you're going for sort of the weathered uh, metal look, you probably want to use a gloss primer if you're going to do one of the high polish colors. And so I'm already coming in with my second coat here, just overlapping. Got a pretty wide spray pattern with it. One of the nice things about the badger brush is that because of the way the needle is shaped, it has a pretty fine atomization. So it lays down the paint nice and smooth compared to like a pache, which will work, but I really like the way this looks. Okay, so that's all blacked up. And I'm gonna set this aside. Just hit it with a little air. What PSR are you shooting at? Um, I've got it set for about 15, but I have this uh, micro air control valve. So I sort of adjust it for what makes the paint spray out nicely. So I can't give you a specific PSI, um, but it's probably in the, the 10 to 15 range. I find the Badger brushes, I think they have sort of a limiter on them as to how much uh, air pressure it lets come out of it. Uh, so, um, not exactly sure what the specific pressure is, but it's it's in that range. And then I'm going to plug in. Uh, actually, I'm going to use a different one. I think. Let's plug in the harder and steam back, and we will lay down the uh, coat through the spray pattern for the pre shading. And I pre mix these paints. Um, one thing that uh, you want to focus on is uh, for the technique, when you're doing sort of the pre-shading, uh, I would recommend a, a six to four ratio between paint and thinner as a good mix. You want a you know, fairly opaque color to lay down for the pre-shading. So um, I'd sort of mix it up by, by drops to get that rough ratio. And then you'll move to uh, some thinner coats to build up the color coats over it. I'm just transferring paint to the brush. Again, uh, yeah, so we've been talking for a few minutes. It's basically dry to the touch, you know, little tack to it at this point, but another minute or so and it'll be good to go. But I pre-painted the other half of it so that uh, we're basically ready to go now. So again, I'm just testing to get the spray pattern, make sure it's atomized like I like it. And this is going to be a little bit higher pressure, maybe, uh, you know, 15 to 20 PSI uh, that I've got coming out of this. And so originally to do the technique, you would build up just like a little squiggles and dots with the paint. Get coming out of here, there you go. And it's, you know, it, it works okay, but I mean, it, it'll take forever if you're trying to build this up, doing it that way. But now with these templates, you can just find the size that you like and 
flip it over and sort of experiment with um, the distance. Uh, if you hold it too close, you're going to get a very stark pattern. So I like holding it off a little bit off the surface. And, and what's a little bit, half an inch, quarter inch? Uh, I'd say a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. Okay. And then you want to check your, uh, basically the pattern to see. I like the smaller uh, holes to work through and I sort of keep it moving as I'm going. So you can see that it's created a, a nice random effect. And you can also look at it and um, as an example for the wing roots where you might get some oil blow back from the engine, maybe keep it a little bit darker, but then as you get out towards the, the tip of the wing, come back in and just lay some more patterns in. And I think it's good to vary the distance because again, you want this to be as random as possible. So that's what we've got going on there. So then the next step uh, is to load up your finish color. And in this case, um, I'm just going with a, to me, a neutral gray. The other thing that um, I like to do with this, just so I can get as good a flow as possible, I use the Tamiya X20 thinner. I had talked about a homebrew thinner recipe that works well for general painting, but I think the Tamiya with Tamiya paint works better in terms of preventing tip dry and clogging and you want this to spray out nicely and evenly. So just getting this mixed up again. And I will move to the other brush. And here, um, because you want to be able to have some control and how quickly uh, you build up, because you can sort of knock back this effect to the point where you like it, play around with it. Um, you want a three to six part ratio from paint to thinner uh, so that it's a little bit thinner mix and you'll have a little more control over being able to build it up in layers. So again, I'm gonna take the tip off the brush. So all over the place. And then we're just gonna start going over and you wanna be a good distance away. Um, don't want it to go on, you know, like dusty, but you want a wide pattern. To start knocking this back, a better angle on it. Maybe alter your angle just a little bit, go in diagonal.
So I'm hoping you can see, I've left it a little starker, but you can see the variations on underneath it. The other thing that's sort of interesting is I found with the Tamiya paint, it looks translucent uh, while it's wet. And then as it dries, it really gets opaque. So be careful as you're building it up that you don't lose too much of your effect. So I'm, I'm hoping that you can still see that. Uh, can I get a little better light on it? But it's a, it's a nice randomized effect and you can knock it back as much as you like. So you can do it as a pre-shade effect like this. But what you can also do is um, do it as a, a post shade. So I'm gonna do that next. And with that, I'm gonna need to do a quick clean here. Um, you can come up with a weathering tone. In this case, I'm using the um, red-brown mix that uh, you see uh, some of the modelers on hyperscale talk about, which is a mixture of um, the Tamiya XF64 red-brown and Tamiya XF1 just flat black. And that technique, you want to really thin it down. So it's going to be a, a two part paint to eight part thinner ratio. Just blowing a cup through a thinner here, get this cleared out a little bit. And then I'll load up this last color. When you mix the red brown on the flat black, it comes out to sort of really dark brown, but when it goes on in thin layers, it's a little bit more on the brown side. And then as you build it up, it'll make it progressively darker. So you can sort of play with it, get it to the point where you like it. And with this technique, you're going to come back to the stencil. And here you're going to want to be a little further back because uh, you don't want any hard shapes, but just work across the stencil, maybe a half an inch. See how it's going and keep the stencil moving. It's pretty subtle, so I'm not sure how well it's going to pick up in here. I hope you'll be able to see it. You can see some of that. It, it just, it's a, another coat of fading and grime that you can put on as thick or as light as you like. And if for some reason it's come out starker than you want or the paint wasn't thin enough, it's easy enough to just come back to your base color and really lightly knock it back. We had a question from Alex who's asking if it's possible to do that with the metal finishes. Hang on one second. Okay, I got the compressor and the air going at the same time. All right, that's pretty good. So that's toned it down to a point where I think it looks it looks pretty nice. So what was the question again? Can you use this with metal finishes? Um, I think you can uh, use it in terms of this um, post shading technique. 
to get sort of a, a, a thin coat of grime on it. I don't know that as a pre-shade, it would work out that well. I have used different colors of primer underneath Alclad uh, as a pre-shade to get the panel differentiation rather than masking off and spraying different colors. But um, this I think more lends itself to uh, actual paint colors rather than metallics. Right. This is Dave yeah. Powell. I, I would be tempted, now I haven't tried it and this is an exciting new approach for me, but with the uh, metal paints, I would be tempted to uh, try various shades of the metal so that you get the kind of ripple effects that you see on, uh, uh, it's very characteristic to some airplanes. And I think that might uh, help with that. I think I'll, I'll try that to see if it works, but that would have to be post, I think, and not pre. And you would want to uh, uh, mix the two colors together so that it was separate. But anyway, that's that's something I'm uh, eager to try. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that could definitely have some possibilities. And as I say, I'm starting out and just experimenting with it. But um, I like the results that it's gotten. And um, as you play around with it, you can try the different distances to see whether the harder or softer shapes give the effect you're looking for. I generally like to spray through the smaller holes side of it uh, than uh, some of the larger holes here, but um, for the post shade effect where you're just trying to add undulations, I think the, the larger holes can work. And again, moving it around as you're spraying also increases the random nature of the patterns and everything. So I think it's uh, definitely something you'll like if you want to give but a try and you know the templates are cheap enough. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is uh, again the benefit of this once you've done all this all the spraying that you're going to do um, just put it on a paper towel and this is just Windex and uh, toothbrush and just gently scrub it off and blot it dry. basically good to go for the next time. Can I hit the other side? So that's that's about all there is to it. I um, hope it's helpful, give it a try and be interested to see what uh, how it works for you guys. That, that was excellent. Anybody have any questions? That, that Windex, is that cheap Windex? Is it what Windex? Cheap, you know, like a dollar store Windex? Uh, well, in this case, it's a uh, brand name Windex, um, uh, but we got it in the refill, you know, gallon bottle, and I just transfer it. I, I only use the Windex for um, cleaning something like this. I don't use it through the airbrush anymore. I used an, an alternate uh, cleaner for clearing out the airbrushes, but um, for anything that you're not worried about, you know, the impact on the chrome or metal, it, it, it cuts to me a paint off of uh, tools or anything else very well. Rafe, I have a question. That's a really, really cool technique. But I was actually also equally interested in um, what did you say that thing was at the end of your airbrush that was that was limiting the airflow? And where do you get those? Uh, probably talking about the uh, microcontrol valve here. Yeah, where do you get one of those? Uh, this happens to be made by Grex and uh, they're available on Sprue Brothers. Okay. If you just, you know, type in Grex in the search button, you'll find the uh, micro air control valve, but it also includes the quick disconnect tip. And then you can buy these individual tips for whatever type of airbrush you have. So it comes with, I think it comes with the micro air control valve, this and a tip for an Awada, which is the equivalent of Grex. And then you can buy uh, tips, uh, fittings for other types of airbrushes separately. And they're not very expensive. It's, I think it's maybe around, 20 bucks for this part. And then um, the fittings are only like seven or $8 for whatever, however many airbrushes you want. And okay. um, the other thing you may notice, this is the Iwata uh, water moisture trap. I yep. put it on the end of the line uh, just to get every last bit of water. I have moisture traps off the compressor too, but this is a nice fail safe uh, when it gets humid in the summer. Hobby Lobby also has the micro air control valve, same as that. And uh, you get your one forty percent off one item. Yeah. Okay. Here's another. Here's another example of those 
stencils that Rafe was talking about. Now, this is, these are none of the the, uh, the the manufacturers that he showed, but they're exactly the same pattern because I was comparing them when he was showing them up there. And I just I just tried wiping some lacquer thinner over these things. Doesn't affect it one bit. Yeah. I think those kind are of gold, the uh, kind of gold. I don't know if you can see it. They're kind of gold in color, right? Yeah, those are the uh, the art, art tool ones. Uh, they may have different brands, but they're identical. But it's kind of like yeah. cardboard, right? It's yeah. it, it, it feels like a cardboard, but again, the lack of thin, it doesn't seem to affect it at all. I got them through Bl uh, Blick Art Art Supplies, and you're right, it's yeah. art tool. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I'm I think, not sure if I mean, they cardboard or. They definitely oh, wow. uh, work. I, I, I just, um, I felt like with the uh, plastic, with the AK, probably over time, a little bit sturdier, but you know, you can probably get a lot of good use out of the, the cardboard version and they're not horribly expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am eager to try the, uh, the photo etch ones just cause you know, yeah, that, that for sure will last. That would be months. the best solution, photo etch. Yeah. The other th think, the thing I that think I, that the, the other technique, I mean, the other application for these things that's very exciting to me is the sort of undulation you get on the side of many ships where the waves have sort of pounded the siding in. So I'm, I'm really excited about it to try that as well on the flower class uh, Corvette I'm building. So, yeah, both, both on the grays and the reds. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, another, another thing on the for, for the metallics, you think using those as a post shade with a very highly thin, to me, a smoke, I think it's XF-18 if I remember, but the, to me, a smoke is really good for post shading on the metallics. The thing I'm going to try first is uh, two shades of metallic, just so it's not mm -hmm. too gross and just see what it looks like. But that does sound like a good idea to me. Yeah. yeah and, and when I say post shading, uh, the other thing you can do with them is uh, you can go with a lighter shade of your paint and sort of go back and forth. Uh, and I've done it with a darkened shade of the base color, a lightened shade of the base color, and then blending everything with a very thin application of the base color. But you can, there's sort of no end to the variations you can do. And um, I've also used it like going with a lighter uh, color over the control surfaces uh, where the, they're covered in fabric and then going, you know, darker in some of the areas like the wing root where you might get some staining and playing around with it. Um, and I, I really feel like I've only scratched the surface, but I've been happy with what's happened with both of the Dauntlesses so far and looking forward to playing around with it some more. The, the yeah, great wing... That, that looks great, like it would be great for uh, doing fading, like for uh, your Pacific Theater stuff or your Vietnam stuff or whatever, fading that same paint. Oh, yeah. Like, like I said, you, you can go you can go yeah. light um, or you can start really light and have a very thin base coat and see where it goes. But I've, I've used it both directions and like over the Dauntless um, on the top areas of the fuselage where it, the sun would hit, I went with uh, lighter colors to fade it out and, and blend it. And like I said, being able to blend with a thin mixture of the base color really lets you knock it back to exactly where, where you want to see it. The, the great wing that he's showing there, um, that's, that, that's very predominant on uh, modern uh, Navy carrier-based aircraft, and it's actually starker. So this this technique's perfect for that. F-14s, F-18s. Yeah, and then when you start laying over like oil rendering and uh, you know some panel line washes and uh, uh, chipping and stuff like that, it it really starts uh, coming into its own. So. Um, there are other things that you can do on top of it that'll um, make it look even better. All right, and you said you're gonna post the links to, um, to Angel's site to where you got those? 
Yeah, so um, I will send you the PowerPoint uh, at the end of the evening and uh, the pictures of the various things are hot linked. So they'll take you right to where they can be got. And in the case of the AK stencils and the, uh, the Ushi set, which actually is being co-branded by Ammo or the ones that he has, it'll, it'll take you right to those. The other thing um, on the, uh, the AK ones, they come in two different scales. So the one I was using was their 148, 172nd scale. This is their 135th, 124th, and 120th. I don't hold too much. I don't think the scale limitation makes that much of a difference. It's, you know, a little bit different pattern. And so, you know, um, either one or both uh, are, are good options. Like I'd say on average, most of the holes are a little bit bigger than uh, on the 72nd scale, but not, not by much. I mean, this is the 72nd scale and you can see the holes here compared to this end of it. So it's sort of six and one, but um, they're inexpensive enough where, you know, having a couple of them, I think it's all about as many different options for making it ran as random as possible or which, which you want to try to try to get. Excellent, excellent. That's very, that is a very cool effect. When you were talking about stencils, I was thinking in terms of national insignia and, and numbers and things like that, but that is, that's a really cool effect. Yeah, when you see it in real life, uh, I think you'll be pretty happy with it. it uh, there's a lot you can do. It's, it's hard to show up on a little camera, but um, it, it's opened up a whole new range of things because I've always been trying to figure out how to get that look and um, there may be other ways to do it, but I can't think of any way that's faster because trying to lay in the squiggles and I've done it, you know, both ways with that too, where you're trying to squiggle as a pre shade or squiggle in lighter color, lighter shades over the base color or try to do the reverse where you're putting the darker tones on and it just takes forever, even on a smaller scale. And, you know, this you saw, I mean, the wing was, this is a 32nd scale P51 wing and, you know, done in, you know, two or three minutes. Um, so that's nice too. Very, very cool. Well, any other questions? All right, well, if you need any bits for that 132nd scale Mustang, I've got a whole bunch of stuff to unload. <laughs> okay, thanks. No problem, thanks for doing that. Sure thing. Okay. John, do you want to go to the um, presentation? Yeah, except that uh, you're going to have to do it because uh, I can't do it here on my iPad. I, yep. I can't. So, hey, uh, Rafe, did you uh, get that uh, that thank you coin? You should have gotten it by now. Rafe's still there or did he leave? I think he left. Okay. Right. No, no, he's still there. He's there. Uh, all right, it, it doesn't matter. I'm sure he got it. Yeah, Rafe, can you hear us? We can see him. He's probably changing over from his two camera thing. Yeah. Okay, well, well, John, I've got the uh, presentation queued up here. Okay. Oops, let's kill that. All right. So, John, I should have your batting order screen up. Yeah, we can see it. Let's go ahead and uh, go into presentation mode. Well, I've got two monitors up. So, well, actually, yeah, let me see if I can do that. See which one. Which yeah. one do you see? Yep, it's presentation mode. Okay, good. All right. All right, Mike, you want to go ahead and uh, start off? Yeah, uh, go go 
jump it. You've got him in there back kind of backwards. So go jump ahead to number eight. Okay. Uh, try number nine. I want to see if that's the earliest one. Okay. Right where you want, number eight. Okay. That is uh, that's the special Abu Kukar in 70 second scale. Uh, there were some earlier points where you know, there were some earlier photos which just showed it under construction and the primer. But at this point, um, I don't know the, the, the underside view is going to be coming up here. But at this point, the underside is, has been sprayed blue and I've masked the underside. So you can kind of just see the mask line at, at where it's starting to cover the, the blue and underneath the horizontal stabilizers. And what you can see, that's the, ba that's the base color. A light tan, I believe it's to me above. Uh, and the uh, upper color is going to be almost like a, a mint green, lighter than what you'd find in a British cockpit, um, but not as light as you'd find in like a, 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 a organic. Uh, so now if you look really carefully, you'll see some little green squiggles on top of the, uh, the tan. This is a hard edge scheme. So Rather than trying to have having to go and mask this whole thing, I just simply took the uh, the green, the, light, the mint green, thinned it way down, and worked my way a hard edge around those those green lines as a guide. And then go to the next one. Let me see if this works. No, now we're going back. <laughs> we're back to the beginning of the build. Okay, just. Do it in your own mind. That was the beginning of the bill. This is in primer. You can see the cockpit's done up there with the exception of the ejection seats. Next. Okay, bottom is painted blue. Wheel well is a mess with some sponge. And the bottom, the bottom is, that is gonna be exposed to the, the green color is also a mess with tape. Keep going. All right, and that's kind of the final version. So after I, after I blocked it in, with the thin green paint, I went back with the airbrush, with the, again, using a very, very narrow spray pattern and started filling it in. So you can see it pretty well, pretty well came out exactly what I wanted. Uh, and then I, then I put the yellow bands on, on, on a vertical stabilizer. The yellow is above and below the wings, but it only goes back to the ailerons, as you can see. Um, that blue bit in front of the uh, nacelle it is bordered, it will be bordered by a silver band. Uh, all the photos of Picaras have a silver band against the blue and then further up towards the front of the tan area. So basically two silver bands separated by tan and then followed by the blue. Um, and this is, you know, I, I've used a coat of uh, Alclad ALC 600 gloss on this and it's pretty well ready for decals. And that's as far as it sits right now. Although, although I have a further picture that has, I've, I've installed the injection seats, which are true details items. And it's coming out really well. So that's about it for me, guys. Hey. Mike, you want to talk a little bit about how you use the uh, liquid gravity? Oh, sure. Go, so go back. Yeah. As you can imagine, this thing would be a real tail sitter. So... Keep on going back, Chris. Let's see if we can get a better view. All right, stop right now. No, go back forward. One, one more. Stop right there. Okay. You can imagine this thing would be a real tail sitter. So I almost always use these days liquid gravity, which is made by deluxe materials. Uh, this is it right here. See what turned around. Okay. And it's millions of little steel balls. You can hear them shaking around there. And uh, they're, they're, I would say they are tinier than the head of a pin. So in this case, what I did, uh, I couldn't figure out any place really under the floor to get it that was wide enough weight under the floor. So what I did is I went, got to this point where it was assembled. And what you can't see in this photo, between the back, the floor and the back cockpit and the back bulkhead, there is a gap of about, eh, maybe, maybe a 30 second of an inch. 
Okay. So that's going to be all be hidden by an ejection seat. So I wasn't worried about that gap. But I used that gap with an eyedropper to pick up bunches of these steel balls and fill the back cockpit up with them and then let them run backwards down that slot then tilted the model forward right, and forward into the nose. I'm getting all kinds of feedback here. And then, and I tilted the model forward and let them run forward into the nose. And I kept on putting them in until... Hang on for just a second. Can everyone go on mute, please, if you're not talking? Okay, that's better. You still hear me? Shake your head. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, I, I, I let the steel balls, tiny little steel balls, liquid gravity run down that little slot. And I, when I had a bunch of them down there, remember now they're living in the back of the fuselage. Then I tilted the model forward. They ran under the floorboard and I continued to repeat that process until the, lit, the, the little steel balls came up to the top of the gap where I poured them through. Then I dropped some super glue down there with a, uh, an injection needle. My wife takes an injection a couple of times a week. So I was able to drop super glue down in that gap and hit it with accelerator. And now that underfloor area all the way up to the nose is one solid block of steel. So problem solved. And, uh, you know, I, I can't, well, go back to the, uh, Chris, go back to the one where it's all painted up, ready for decals. One, keep going right there. See, now it's sitting on the nose, no problem at all. So that's how I got the weight in, in the nose. And liquid gravity is great. I mean, you can, you can fill any cavity with it to the exact shape. Forget about fishing sinkers and all that stuff. I, now look, this, this works on 70 second scale models. That's all I do. How much you're gonna to have to put in there for 48? Probably a lot more, but it does work. Does it come with its uh, own adhesive, or do you, is it you have to add the super glue to lock it in place? Super glue. Uh, always super glue. You get it into the cavity you want, and then you hit it with a drop of super glue, a drop of accelerator, and it's an instant steel block. Okay. And, and I've said this. I've said this on these Zoom pressures presentations. Could you like mix it up with like epoxy if you wanted to like layer it in places? Yeah, I'm sure you could. Anything that's going to hold the steel yeah. balls in places. But I've said this before, and it. it <clears throat> it's going to be hard to believe. Maybe there's a physicist out there that could explain this. But if if you take a certain amount of these steel balls, and if you had a way to weigh them, they would weigh X grams. Okay. Now you get them into a cavity, hit it with the super glue. All of a sudden, it weighs <clears throat> a, probably about a third more than than its original weight. I don't know why that happens. It makes no sense at all. But that's my experience, having used it a dozen times now. So anybody got a real a, a, a scientific answer that for that? I'm open to it, but I don't. I would think the Still super works. glue, the super glue would expand once it uh, uh, the accelerator hit it. Okay. So it might, you know, being going from a thin substance to a thicker substance, it would add the weight. Good enough. Good good as an explanation as any. One thing though is don't yeah, put too much. Yeah, but that doesn't much... add mass. That yeah, doesn't don't... increase its mass. No, it does not. No. One it's thing not... though is don't use too much super glue because it generates heat. It sure does. If you just and it could, it you can melt right through the plastic sometimes. A little bit at a time. A little yes. bit at a time. And that bottle that Mike showed weighs about two pounds <laughs> when it's full. When it's it, full, it's right. remarkably heavy. It's not cheap. It's like 25 bucks with a bottle. Yeah, but you'll use oh, it yeah. forever. I mean, I, I've still got probably three quarters of a bottle left. <clears throat> you Mike mentioned that... Um, Say again, Ray. You were using uh, the True Detail seats. You mentioned that you were using True Detail seats. Yeah. Um, were they for that particular airplane, or are they a generic seat? You know, True Details, are, I guess, has gone with Squadron. Who, who so. the, the, they are uh, True Details Mark Seven Martin Baker Mark Seven seats. The uh, Pukara used Martin Baker Mark Six seats, and those two types are, are defined by the large parachute pack. That again, you can't see it in this row. They're in there now. Let me see if I can hold it up. 
can you switch me over to, let's see, who can see that? Okay, that's good. Let's see. Look at, look at the headrests. Let me get up the camera here. Okay. The Mark, Mark 6 seats and the Mark 7 seats are almost identical. Um, the difference that I can see in the Mark 7 and 6 seats is that the Mark 7 seats have two side pull handles, whereas the Mark 6 seats have it over the head and in between the legs. But other than that, I can't see any difference. Maybe in the harnesses, but hey, close enough for government work, you know. Yeah. No, I'm just uh, with uh, Squadron gone now. I'm interested in what's going to happen with some of those lines, like the uh, true details. Yeah. And the everything. beautiful seats, because the belts are molded into them. Um, I have a stock of them, you know, probably last as long as I'm going to last. But I hope somebody picks up the line and, and redoes them, because they're really beautiful. So one quick question about that super glue. Is that, is that medium super glue or the real thin stuff? You want it, you want it to super thin stuff. To allow it to flow, flow be, between the balls, the, uh, the steel the liquid gravity. And, and the only thing I'll add is, if you're going to put that in like the nose of an aircraft or something, like around that cockpit, just make sure that it is absolutely positively sealed, or else those tiny little balls <laughs> will find any little gap, and you'll end up with all the weight in the tail of the aircraft. He's right. He's absolutely right. Uh, whatever, you do, no. <laughs> whatever you do, don't spill the bottle. Just no, oh, go God. everywhere. Get, if, if you do spill the bottle, get a very big magnet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, actually, it works really well if you get a pan or like a pie tin or something and you you put that underneath whatever you're putting the, uh, the little balls in because yeah. inevitably some of them, you know, escape. I, I've used those in floats on uh, Japanese float planes, and uh, same thing though. I, I just used regular uh, white glue and uh, let it sit overnight and it tipped the floats up so the weight was down in the nose. That would work. And that's it's held for a long time, but it's, it really is a great way to get the weight in. And another, another good point about this stuff is if you forget to put weight in the nose and all of a sudden <laughs> it's all done, and you, you realize the thing is a tail sitter, any little cavity, a hole, a, a 16th of an inch wider, you can find a way to get a, 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 a um, oh, a, a, what am I trying to think of? The, these, you know, uh, these things, wait a minute. Like a funnel? No. You can make a funnel out of a piece of paper. That, that's what I do, yeah. A little pipette, a pipette. Oh, there you go, okay. Yeah. Uh, that'll pick up the sealed balls and you can get them down that hole and then drop some super glue in and all well, like Jerry said, maybe some white glue and it'll work, but it's a lifesaver. It really is. And, and you Jerry, that, that's, uh, that's timely because I've got that Japanese flow plan I'm working on right now. So that's a great idea with the white glue. Thanks. You can get, you can get the, you can get, of course you can get this stuff online from Horizon Hobbies, uh, probably a dozen other suppliers. But I know that Hobbytown USA carries it in the source. However, many of them are left. There was one in Fredericksburg. And as there are several down here where I am in South Carolina, but um, yeah, you definitely get it online. Okay, so we'll move on. Yep. I built a uh, float plane and it was a tail sitter. So I did exactly what Mike said. I drilled a hole and uh, put the uh, liquid gravity through that hole and put squirted in the uh, white glue, set it on its end, and then just took a disc and, and glued it over the hole that I had drilled, mm -hmm. so like an access port on the uh, float. But yeah, it's great. And it uh, saved me from having to tear the floats apart to put the weight in. Good to know. Definitely good to know. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you want to talk to us about your P-51D from High Plains? Sure. This is, uh, this is one kid. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. sir. Yeah, I, 
All right, so this is one I decided, I haven't built a lot of 170 T scale. Uh, so I said, I'll, I'll go ahead and give this one a wing. So I took some pictures of the sprue. You can see what I was working with in the beginning. And the goal for me, for a lot of these kits, cause we just moved here up from Houston to Purcellville is all the kits I'm gonna build now, I'm gonna try to build in a, in a frame or a box or something that I can protect them because between the in-laws and the wife and everybody, I, I've not been successful of migrating kits. So that was the foundational rule for me. So uh, this is an old kit that I bought. I, I, I do a lot of the, you know, buy a lot of kits from people to sell online. And, and this was one I found. Uh, I've got actually, it was about 10 kits from High Plains. They're very popular for the air racers. So you can go to the next picture. And this is one I figured I would go with a hard one and uh, was really working on how to mount this uh, with the different variations. So I ended up uh, cutting and in 30 years of building, I've never really used a, the hacksaw blade, but now that I've got it, I've cut, I cut up everything <laughs> and started scrap building. Uh, so I scrap built scrap build the lower uh, waste gate on the Mustang there and ended up soldering. I, I, I've embedded magnets in here to play with what I can and cannot do. And I found that, uh, you know, on the straight axis for magnets, they work very good, but on the, the Y axis, they're terrible. But at the end of the day, I ended up just, uh, you know, modifying that air gate and then just doing that, that uh, T intersection that I soldered with the very thin wire on there. So that allows me, cause I wanted to be able to take it off and put it on really quick. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, and with that, uh, because I had the copper tubing, I, I went ahead and started embedding, you know, kind of cutting up more of the pieces. But it, from the condition of the plastic, I'm basically rebuilding everything from Tamiya Putty. Uh, you can see the nose. I'm working on shaping that profile, and hopefully I'll get that done. Uh, but I do like this technique for all the props now. I think I'll use this from now on where I embed the, I get two of the brass pipes, brass pipes from Hobby Lobby and they slide through together very well. And so any of the moving parts, I can help form those. Nope. Can go to the next one. That is uncomfortable. Can we go to the next slide. And there you can see I've got it mounted. So what it is, this is gonna, it's gonna be, uh, you know, the Mustang's gonna be rounding a, a, a air pylon. This, Plane came from the Reno, this is a version from Reno 1972. So in the Speed Racer forum, a lot of the guys actually got me pictures of the pylon in 1972, which is good because it seems to change every year. Um, so, and actually last night I just cut the, cock, the canopy and got that fitted out. And so it's in kind of the rough shape right now as I kind of get it uh, cut and clean, but I should start airbrushing it and get it started painting here shortly to start smoothing everything up. I actually just finished the ailerons and getting that going. But it was good practice on a, uh, you know, a hack of a plane and just to really focus on very small detail. I, and I actually found I actually enjoy the 170 second scale because I want to get so ridiculous in the, in the detail. I have to use, you know, you know, my, my glasses to help see everything. But <laughs> then when I go to the 148 scale, the 130 second scale, I'm like, oh, this is easy. I actually get more into scratch building now into the 148 and 172 scale or 130 second scale going, you know, practicing on this. So I'll probably do a flip to go between 172nd uh, uh, up to the 148 and kind of work the scales up and down to keep practice with it. You can go to the next slide. But there you can see, uh, you know, I've been playing around with the control uh, things, the control uh, surfaces, and I found just embe in embedding a pin into uh, using the thin uh, super glue and then using zapper into there works very well where now all the control surfaces, I can, I, I played with magnets, but that's still too much of a pain. This was the very easy. And then I take those metal rods and I put about a 20 degree kink in them and they can all slip into place. And then I can pull them out or reposition them uh, very easily within that system. And I ended up having to uh, basically re-spin the spinner. The spinner was kind of out of balance as you can see in the mold, but I ended up just putting that on a Dremel and spinning it and sanding it down. But so far, I've been happy with the results of how good that saw uh, does for cutting out some of the parts. So like I said, I'm going to get more practiced in cutting out as many pieces as I can and working at the scale if I can. 
I looks good. That's, that's a lot of work considering what it, did, it looked like on the sprues in the first picture there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's like I said, it was kind of challenging, you know, and cleaning it up and, and, and really, I used to not really care about sandpaper. I'd have two, two forms of sandpaper, rough and thin, but now at this scale, it makes me look through and understand the different um, levels of sandpaper to start working and especially uh, working with, you know, when you cut an aileron out or you cut those flaps to make a straight line. And I'm, ama I'm amazed how much just visually I can make a straight line or the human eye can visualize just a, a slight imperfection in the line and just hand sanding it does actually pretty good uh, with the file sets I have. And it's just, this is just stock tools I got from Hobby Lobby. I think the, the, the saw I bought on, online, but the, the rest of the tools I've just been buying from Hobby Lobby. Well, here's an experiment you could try when you're done get a block of wood and carve one and compare them and decide whether it's easier just to start with a block of wood and carve out all the pieces. Yeah, that's true. And I've did 3D printing. Actually, there's a maker shop here in Percival. I'm going to look at uh, what their machine and I've had 3D printing before. And, and like I said, I've really started liking to do the, the scratch building just with the raw sheets of plastic and seeing how far I could take that. But yeah, the wood blocks too, I think that might push me into getting into molding again. Yeah, I, when I was a kid, my father, and I, I was little, I was eight or nine, or I don't know. And he, my dad was a modeler when he was young. So that's back in the, God knows when, I don't know what kind of number it would be. But he had some wood down there and he said, well, I'll show you how to do this. And he cut out and he, and then in an afternoon, he carved a twin engine, like a, uh, it wasn't a DC-3, but one of those twin engines of that period. It, it was beautiful. And now, uh, yeah, and I guess when he was a kid, they didn't have plastic models or anything. They wanted to have a, a model. They got a piece of wood and started cutting the sucker up and, and, and it was just amazing. Which is why I don't do that because I know that I would never be like that. <laughs> yeah, it would take a little bit more dense work on it for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Well, post progress, like I said, if I get the airbrush to it and, and start getting it scribed in panel lines, I think it'll be good to go. and get the diorama put together so it can flip. And I wanted to take it off because I was going to put a lot of work on the bottom so you can just take it off and look at it. It's actually a fun scale to kind of, you know, play around with and lay in different scenarios into the diorama. But I just put together that wood um, diorama scene fairly, just, you know, rough cut wood in the shop. So we'll see how it goes this month. Nice. All right. Nicely done, nicely done, okay. Uh, let's see, so next up is actually my 109. Um, I had the Eduard Weekend Edition kit. Still took me a month to do it, but I'm not sure how they do weekends, but uh, it's built out of the box, you know, quarter scale. Uh, this is Barkram's aircraft. Um, I've used the Eshi, um, not, not uh, the, the stretchable thread, that's what's the antenna wires there. And this was my first attempt with the Grex airbrush, the new one that I got, um, that to, to try to do the splotches on it. Um, so this is all MRP paint. Um, like I said, just, just built out of the box. Um, let's see. The, um, the wing pattern, now the extra aircraft, the zigzags were a little less uniform but I just couldn't seem to quite get the pattern right. So I just used pinking shears, which Tim's wife will appreciate um, to get the step. Uh, so Chris, uh, it was, it was a hard edge, hard edge scheme? Yeah, yeah, for the wings, not on the fuselage, but on the wings. Yeah, I see that, yeah. Yeah. Unusual for a German aircraft at that time. The wings actually had hard, hard, um, Camo. I've got a book that actually came with it on the 109Gs, um, and I'm looking at the uh, a G10 as well. And the wings did tend to have hard lines um, on the color differentiation, and then on top of the fuselage. Let's see. I don't know. Yeah. So there, on the top of the fuselage, you'll see there's hard lines as well. But the, on the sides of the fuselage itself, it, it was much softer. Right. And then uh, on the bottom, I did a bit of a wash, pull up a little bit dirtier, 
pull out some of the nice rivet detail. Um, like I said, this is pretty much straight out of the box. This is straight out of the box. Looks good. Thanks. Okay, Alex. Yeah, hi, uh, good evening all. Uh, this is Alex and I'm just gonna talk about the, uh, Vic, the Valam Vickers uh, uh, Valletta. Uh, Valam is a Czech manufacturer, very limited production, but this I believe is their attempt to build models for the average modeler. And I consider myself pretty average. Um, this, it gives you no interior at all. So I supplied it with an interior uh, using a 0.4 millimeter rod from uh, Plastruct. And on the real aircraft, uh, when the paratroop door is removed to drop cargo, you have to actually pin it to the wall. And that's exactly what I've done here. And I've only done one side because uh, when you view through the paratroop door, you're only going to see uh, one side of the aircraft. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, glass on this kit is excellent quality and uh, the parts fit is not too bad. And uh, as I said, the detail throughout is excellent. If I could have the next one. Wait, wait a minute. So on, <clears throat> on this sidewall that we're looking at, every one of those horizontal stringers you put in individually? Uh, they are, um, wait, let me uh, be more precise here. Uh, I laid them uh, in strips and then I placed the formers uh, over them. So the, the verticals I placed over the horizontals. So the horizontals are one continuous strip. Uh, the verticals are um, individual strips of, uh, of, uh, uh, of styrene. And I used a contour gauge to uh, measure the curvature of the interior of the fuselage so that I would know uh, how, to, um, how to cut those vertical risers. Alex, how about, the, how about the bottom section of that? Is that, it almost looks like some of that corrugated sheet that you'd make HO scale roofing out of. That's exactly what it is, uh, Mike. <laughs> it's, uh, and, and on the real aircraft that there was a, uh, like a buffer that was added to the interior so that if you were moving cargo around, you wouldn't uh, uh, push it accidentally through the, the airframe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, the British do think about a few things. This was one of their uh, several DC-3 replacements. Okay, uh, this is the, uh, the top of the fuselage toward the cockpit. Uh, the kit is good in shape, but I wasn't too happy with the way the cockpit was molded as it meets the, uh, the clear area. And it was entirely too flat. So I used layering uh, a kind of laminate uh, using half millimeter sheets of uh, evergreen plastic and uh, built that up along with uh, Mr. Surfacer 1000 and uh, also sanded the uh, cockpit eyebrow windows to reshape them because they need to have a slightly different shape. I didn't have a whole lot of thickness to work with and had to be very uh, careful uh, not to sand through it. But if we have the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, the immediate results, yes. So what we have here is uh, a more ogival appearance for the fuselage, which is exactly what you want. Uh, and uh, as it goes up to the Astrodome, uh, it should be uh, much more rounded than what the kit gives you. And yes, indeed, those are crew figures in the cockpit. I have a crew on board. Uh, next slide. And uh, here it is uh, ready for paint. And you can see how I've built up the, uh, I was a little uh, too, mm, uh, enthusiastic with the sandpaper. And so I had to rebuild some of the lost curvature with uh, successive layers of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of filler putty. And what you see here are actually uh, mountings for the props. Uh, in the, the prop join is very poor on this kit. And uh, on the real aircraft, you can't see the engine at all. It's, too, it's set too far back and the originals actually had cooling fans. What I've done is I've uh, sawed uh, short sections of copper uh, that fit nicely around the half inch diameter uh, plastic plastic tubing. And uh, if the uh, prop 
uh, body appears to be a little bit out of round, I can rotate it gently and it actually makes sure that uh, everything uh, is exactly uh, lined up. And it's also a convenient way for uh, uh, <clears throat> putting, you know, moving the model around uh, to shows and, and what have you. We can always be optimistic. And then uh, next slide, please. So what we have here is the, uh, the results of, of this work, which is to show the, the, the new roundedness of the forward fuselage section. And the masking, of course, is for the, uh, the Royal Air Force Transport Command Scheme. Mm. And that's all I have to share with you today. Uh, any questions? Alex, do you think you'll be, you think a cup that, like, for instance, that vertical panel line behind the glass, you think they'll be re rescribing that to get a little bit deeper? To, yeah, right. Uh, I, I don't know, actually. Um, I, I don't like them to be really, really deep uh, in this scale. I'm not talking uh, about deeper. I'm just talking about make, making a match what's around them. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, I'll, I'll consider that. Yeah. I, I know that IPMS judging criteria can be pretty strict about that. And it would just be a quick, a quick pass with a scriber would do it. I mean, very light touch. Okay. I'll, I'll try that. Okay. Uh, mind you that it's over primer and it's over um, uh, uh, Mr. Hobby mm -hmm. 1000. Yeah. 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 No, thanks so much. Okay, mm -hmm. nicely done. Thank you. Jerry, you're up next. Well, I'm continuing to build these old uh, stock cars. And uh, this is the latest one that I'm doing. This is a uh, MPC kit. And of course, uh, model cars, I think, are primarily marketed to uh, young men. And uh, I was really surprised because this had very poor fit. I had to, to trim and modify almost all of the parts uh, dimensionally to get it the uh, final assembly together. So it was uh, not an easy quick build. And uh, anyway, this is uh, the chassis, of course, and the uh, interior uh, panel to cover the fuel tank and all that. And I did wire the engine. Uh, just to add a little more detail. And I also used a uh, very miniature uh, PE to do uh, the uh, wiring looms and uh, takes the optivisor to get those things put together. <laughs> but uh, that's that next slide. Yeah, a little, just a little bit better uh, view of how the uh, engine went together and, and the details. And uh, one more. Now this is where it's set uh, this afternoon. I uh, communicated with Mike Fleckenstein and he's always recommending Alclad 600 as your gloss coat for decaling. And uh, I applied it yesterday, <clears throat> let it set overnight. And in fact, down in the shop, the decals are on and I was really pleased. That was my first time to use that Alclad 600 aqua gloss and uh, it lived up to uh, all the recommendations Mike had given. And uh, that's it. That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I use the, uh, I picked up a bottle of the Alphad 600 as well and, and use that. Um, it goes on milky and you're kind of like, okay, what did I just do? But then it dries perfectly crystal clear and glossy. It's gorgeous. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, for me anyway, it, it is, yeah, you're right. It is milky in the bottle, but as I'm spraying it, it's clear on the model. Yeah, that, that was my experience. And uh, I did uh, two light coats with about 10 minutes between the coats. And uh, as I was doing it, I have a, an LED light uh, fixture over my spray booth. And I, I made sure that I could see that the, um, the aqua gloss going on was wet. Mm-hmm. I was very pleased with it. First time I used it, pretty impressed. Very nice. It does seem to level itself out nicely too. Right. Yep. Yeah. Also, another another little trick to it, you know, on and I still use Future Flowax or Pledge New Flowax for canopies as well. But this stuff also works great on canopies. You can dip a canopy in it, and I would say it's a hair. It's a hair, uh, 
more striking, the best word I can think of it, than even with future. Now, having said that, uh, Deluxe Materials also makes an, another product that's made specifically for dipping, dipping canopy. So I can't imagine how good that is if, if the uh, ALC 600 is so good. And I forget the name of it. You could, uh, you could Google it online, you'd find it. But it's, it, you can dip a canopy and it's, it's just like a little jewel when you get it out. Hmm. One thing I'd be interested in seeing for a tip night, if uh, Mike, you were willing to share or anybody else is uh, glossing a model. Cause yeah. I find that, you know, I can get it glossed well enough for the decals to go on after a flat coat, but still when you've got like with your Pucara where you've got the nacelles, I was end up getting like a shadow where you're spraying over the nacelle and it gets uneven. And I've, I've never been able to get like a really nice gloss finish. Um, the way that I'd, I'd like to be able to, and your stuff looks great. When you say a shadow, you mean it? It, it kind of, it kind of gets less of a luster in certain places. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, with I find with the ALC six hundred, for instance, when I did the Kukara, I set it flat, and I did all the upper surfaces, let that dry, then I gave the bottom surfaces a coat, then ten minutes later I came back and did the top surface again, then the bottom surface again, and Looking at it, I'm looking at it now. It's it's an even gloss over the whole model. There's there's not, no either there's no area that's more dull than the next. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that demonstration. I I don't know how I don't know how I could do that because my air, my spray booth is over there, and the camera is here on the computer. So uh, if somebody's if somebody's uh, could instruct me how to use the cell phone like like Rafe did there. We could probably do that. Yeah, well, I, um, work on that. Okay. I picked I picked up a tripod in preparation for doing this off of Amazon. It was fifteen bucks, and it just sits on the tabletop, and it will hold any iPhone, and you can you know change the angle so you can get it. And then if you oh, flip the yeah. screen, uh, you can get it. The other nice thing that it came with is a um, automatic. I guess the version of an automatic cable release, a remote. Mm -hmm. So it hooks in with the Bluetooth. So if you want to take, you know, finished model pictures, you can set it up and then you don't have to worry about hitting the phone and it vibrate and you, you can uh, use the, the remote to take the pictures. Well, what, the, ca the cable that the attaching cable that attaches this camera to the, to the uh, computer is easily long enough to make it over to the spray booth. So that's an idea. I mean, I have a photo tripod. I can put it on there because I have this camera on the clip. That's an right, idea. Right. Let's keep going. We got Tim Barb uh, waiting here. Right. We got a few more to go through. So, Tim, you're up next. Okay. I saw this cartoon in the Washington Post, and I forget what day it was. But uh, if you take a look at it, you know, it's the uh, uh, failed, failed stealth technology. And I thought, hey, this would make a great humor in modeling diorama. So if you go to the next one, I've got the Airfix uh, Dakota, 70 second scale uh, Dakota, uh, the kit that comes with the plane and the Jeep. And I said, okay, I'll make up. I've, I had some googly eyes in the, in the box. And uh, I went out and bought one of the fake nose and mustache glasses and uh, got the hair for that, took it off, took the uh, hair off, and they were velcroed on, so that's pretty. It was pretty convenient, and uh, I went ahead and uh, uh, put the plane together, and I made up the uh, nose just that, or the, made up the glasses out of just scrap plastic, and uh, uh, they're just right now they're just sitting on the uh, front of it, and uh, uh, the beard or the mustache right now is just uh, taped on because I have to paint the bottom of it. But one of the things that, that's really perfect timing about tonight is that uh, I've got the AK uh, uh, template that I was going to use on this plane. You know, I was going to use it to, uh, uh, you know, make it do what basically do what uh, Rafe did tonight with his. So uh, watching how he did it, uh, that's, that's probably going to be project for tomorrow afternoon 
is uh, uh, play with that a little bit and uh, see what I can come up with. But once I get this done, I plan on uh, uh, scrounging through the uh, scrap box and see if I can find a couple of uh, uh, 70 second scale figures that I can modify to make them look like the ones in the cartoon. And I'm gonna send a picture to the uh, cartoonist and say, hey, your, your uh, cartoon gave me an idea and uh, here's what I did of it and see, maybe he'll send me back a, a, you know, an autographed copy of the cartoon or something that I can put next to the, uh, uh, next to the model whenever I, whenever I enter it in a contest. So that's where I am right now. I, I still have to uh, finish up the rest of the model, but uh, I figured that was cute. It'll, it'll look good on the, uh, on the table. Fleckenstein's always saying, don't you do anything serious? And I said, nah, it's more fun to see this kind of stuff on, uh, on the modeling tables. I'm, ju I'm just sitting here making myself not shake my head. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, do you need, uh, do you need some 170 I, second figures? Say again, please. Do you need some 170 second figures? No, I've got a bunch of them uh, in the stash, and I've got a bunch of them in the uh, uh, in my figure drawer. So okay. I'm gonna, I'll just, I'll just modify them. Uh, I showed this to the uh, uh, people over in England, and uh, uh, to our sister club over in England, and they said it looked like a Muppet. So I, I, it looks a little bit like animal, but. Uh, then they started singing the Menomina song, and I said, "Oh, these guys are all right." <laughs> are you gonna Are you gonna join in tomorrow on that one, Tim? No, I I can't do it tomorrow. I told John and I told Cheryl that I couldn't. Uh, I've got another uh, commitment for tomorrow afternoon, but I'll be yeah, on the next week. I couldn't. I couldn't last week because I was down getting my COVID shot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but I will. No, be I'll be on. Week. I'll be on next week, but not uh, not tomorrow. All right, so next up we've got Mr. Rotrammel with his Kinetic F-16 and more clamps than I've ever seen in my life on, on one model. <laughs> this model uh, didn't want to go together all that much, uh, so I, I clamped it. I clamped the heck out of it. <laughs> really? And, uh, and it actually it turned out much better than I thought it would uh, as far as fitting together. Uh, but it just took a little force. Uh, the white part there is an Israel cast uh, uh, modifi modified part for the F-16I. Uh, go ahead and go to the next, next picture. Uh, I decided to use the uh, Ares or Quick Boost or whatever, the uh, Aero Bonus, I guess it is, figures in this and what I discovered was the uh, uh, two things. The arms are meant for a Vietnam era airplane that has a stick in the center and, uh, and not, a, not a side stick. So I had to make some modifications to the pilot to get his arm over by the side stick. Uh, the other thing that it has is the, the helmets are Vietnam era helmets. And I pointed that out to him. What I did was I got the uh, uh, Hasegawa uh, EA-18, and it has two sets of heads, uh, one with the Jimix helmet and the other with the, more or less a regular helmet. So I, I used those helmets, and as a, I, I ended up today having to uh, cut the heads off and lower the necks uh, so that the canopy would fit over over the guys. So if you do something stupid like that, make sure that the heads don't stick up above the, uh, the, the headrest or the, uh, the seat back. Uh, next picture. Uh, one of the things with the F-16i is it had bulge gear doors. And so I uh, used a little bit of plastic card and some putty and uh, bulged the gear doors. Uh, next picture. And there you can see how the gear doors turned out. Next picture. Hey Jim, yep. is, it, is this metal right here, or what did you, what is this up here? 
in front of on the that side door. on that side the whatever that thing is it's an exhaust vent oh, sorry is, uh, is metallic and the other side it's it's uh, camouflaged oh gotcha okay uh, so that's uh, that's what it, uh, the canopy is uh, masked and uh, will remain so until I've got all the camouflage on it. Uh, I got some of the uh, Jay's model uh, masking for it. And if you have any of those sets, what you'll discover is that they don't come with, they've got numbers and what, or not numbers, but they've got uh, letters on them to tell which is a, a green or a brown or a sand color, but they don't have any instructions that tell you, you know, this goes there and this goes someplace else. So that's uh, going to be a, entirely an, an adventure on its own. Uh, next picture. And I've also got an F-16 XL that I'm working on. Uh, that's the bottom of it. You can see all the 16 uh, pylons that go with it. And with the XL-2, uh, the sway braces are not included in the kit. If you have the, the single seater, the dash one, the sway braces are included with the kit. So go figure. Um, uh, the other thing that I discovered in doing this, I thought I'd be really smart and uh, attach the uh, the landing gear struts and everything to the part that's on the bottom or on the top as you're looking at it here. And, uh, and that be, way I'd be able to paint this uh, heater ferrous uh, paint scheme and then go back later and just drop that whole main gear uh, in there. And it turns out I was able to do that with a lot of elbow grease because the thing, uh, there's a, a slight, uh, edged or ledged to the thing and you end up having to use a lot of elbow grease to force it in there. It was uh, not a pleasant experience. Learned a few new words. Uh, next picture. <laughs> and there's the top of it. Uh, so it's, it's getting there. It's still got a couple of problems, but uh, one thing uh, to note is the leading edge of the uh, one more. The leading edge uh, flap on the outboard uh, corner, that actually tilts up like you see it uh, when the thing was uh, parked on the ground. So that's not a mistake. That's actually the way the thing positioned it uh, when it was uh, parked. So that's it for me. What did you think of the kinetic kit other than seems like it takes an awful lot of force to, to get things in place? Well, uh, I don't totally blame kinetic for that because I was using the, uh, the Wolfpack uh, uh, cockpit uh, interior and I did quite a bit of sanding on that to get it to, to uh, close up. Uh, so I, I'm not going to throw any stones at Kinetic for that. Uh, sometimes when you do all sorts of fancy stuff, you get yourself into trouble and you just have to work your way out of the trouble. But uh, it's, it's an okay kit. I haven't built a Tamiya kit. I've got a couple of those. Uh, maybe someday when I get one, one of the Tamiyas built, I'll give you a rundown on, uh, on which is easier to build. Uh, if you go back a couple of slides... Uh, so we can see the bottom of the regular F-16. Uh, no, I take that back. I can't show you that right now because I don't have them on there. The leading edge uh, flaps on the thing, there is a, a eighth of an inch uh, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, a, a molding error, or not a molding error, but it's uh, a plug sticking out of the bottom of the flap that you have to sand down on. I was, I was just shocked at that. Uh, most of that stuff is on the interior where it's easy enough to cut off. Uh, but the, this on have something like that on the exterior of the airplane was, was pretty shocking. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. 
So that's it for me. Great. Any, any other comments for Jim? Okay. It is open mic time. Anybody else have anything that they want to share? One, yeah, one thing I might, one thing point I might bring up about the Pukara. The Pukara is going to be in, in the markings of aircraft number A511, which is the one that was shot down by Sharky Ward in a Harrier. Uh, pilot, uh, the guy pilot, the, the Pukara pilot's name was Tomba. T-O-M-B-A, and he bailed out, and he landed fine, and he survived. Just a couple of years ago, they found the wreckage of that airplane almost intact, laying in a field on the Falklands. And I have to have a picture of it. Uh, but uh, it's it almost came down, it almost came down flat, and like kind of pancaked on, on this meadow. Right in the middle, it was found by two sheep herders. So yeah, that's all I had extra. What were their names? Of, say again? What were the names of the sheep herders? You know, I know that. If you're really <laughs> interested, if you're really interested, I can go over and look. Why is that? Right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. What was the name of the What were the names of the sheep? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ba. One, two, three. <laughs> This is just so, what the tripod looks like I was mentioning. Um, and uh, I'm trying to see if it's got a brand. If you Google it on Amazon, you can find it. It's about 15 bucks. And um, the phone, it's got an expandable clip. It goes up and down. And so you can okay. clip the phone into it and set right on the it would, it, would, it would clip right on, the, the, my camera would clip right on the top of my regular photo tripod. So it, that would work just as well. So I decided to uh, dive into dioramas for real, not just, you know, a few things here and there. So this picture was one that my father took at Tan Sun Nut um, back in 1967. I don't know if you can see, you got two RF-101s, a CH-3C, and an AC-47. So I'm doing it in 172nd scale 